Good afternoon. Uh, welcome each of you to uh, this uh, a very first for the life of grace and that is our very first uh, Facebook Live event. Um, my name is Boz Chivijan. Uh, I am the executive director and founder of, of Grace. And I just first, on behalf of the panelists, want to thank each of you for joining us. Um, we know that uh, even though many of us are quarantined, there's a lot going on. And for you to take time out of your uh, busy Saturday to join us for this discussion is uh, an encouragement to us. And we're just glad you're here. So thank you for, for being with us today. I just wanted to share a little as we begin about grace. I don't want to assume that everybody who is participating with us this afternoon is familiar with this organization. Uh, you know, I won't give you the long story, but uh, a very long story short is uh, years ago, I was a, a child abuse prosecutor and I handled many, many cases. And one of the things that was really disturbing to me was how oftentimes churches and faith communities um, failed in either protecting vulnerable people or failing in responding appropriately. And so, you know, years after that, I, I came together with a group of an amazing group of people, uh, multidisciplined experts who uh, had two things in common. Uh, they loved Jesus and they all had an expertise uh, in this area, whether it was theology, whether it was psychology, whether it was law, and we decided to come together and form grace for the purpose of helping to transform Christendom, to become the community that is the most welcoming, the most protecting of children and vulnerable people, and the most supportive of those who have survived abuse. We've got a long way to go, but we've come a long way as well. And so we are, we are starting our, I think, 16th year uh, as uh, an organization, and we're doing some pretty amazing things. Uh, Grace, you know, the two big things Grace is involved with are our safeguarding initiative, where we go into churches and other faith organizations, and we spend anywhere from three to six or seven months with that organization and helping them educate uh, every demographic within that community on these issues, all, from leadership all the way down to children, helping them develop child safeguarding policies and procedures that satisfy best practice standards, and ultimately helping them transform the culture of that community to become what I believe is a much more and much more accurate and much more beautiful reflection of Jesus, a place where children are safe and survivors are welcomed. We also do independent investigations where somebody comes forward and says, something happened to me years ago, and that, that the person who's responsible for doing that was connected to this church, do something about it. And a church has no clue what to do at that point in time, other than reporting this to law enforcement, Grace will come in and do an independent investigation and will help identify where the failures occurred, the failures in protecting, but also where are the failures and how the church responded. Why do so many survivors flee from the church, flee from faith communities instead of running towards them? There's a reason for that. And oftentimes it's because of the profound failures that churches um, engage in and when responding to these things. And what we can do with that is we can provide recommendations so that they can A, demonstrate genuine repentance to those survivors who were hurt, and B, transform their culture so something like that never happens again. That is a snapshot of the work of Grace. You can learn so much more about the organization at our website, netgrace.org. But we, uh, again, are grateful for you being here uh, the reason why we're doing this event today is as we were talking as a group not long ago, we realized that there are a lot of people struggling right now. There are a lot of people struggling for lots of different reasons, but one, one amazing group who is really struggling significantly are abuse survivors uh, abuse for various reasons. And whether it's because they feel stuck at home, they feel out of control, they don't understand the future, there's a lot of anxiety. And quite frankly, it's not just limited to to abuse survivors, it's so many of us. And so we thought, wow, wouldn't it be amazing if we could bring together a group of experts and a group of my friends, so I can hang out with them this afternoon, and, and talk about these issues with the hope 
with the hope that all of us can leave this discussion today uh, more encouraged, more knowledgeable, and more hopeful. And we do it today because most of you may know this, but April is Child Abuse Prevention Month. And tomorrow is designated as what's called Blue Sunday. And it's a Sunday set aside in April uh, for people of all faiths to pray for abused and neglected children. So we thought, what a better time to do it, do this discussion than on the Saturday before Blue Sunday. And this can get us teed up for tomorrow to be thinking and praying for the many kids and vulnerable people who will not be able to join us today, who are suffering in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. And so we are grateful uh, for you. Thank you for joining us. And I wanna dive right into our discussion with our great panelists. I wanna introduce uh, each of them very briefly. I could literally spend a half an hour talking about each one and uh, they probably wouldn't like it and you probably wouldn't either. So I'm gonna be very brief, but there's a lot more there. First, we have Victor Veith. I've known Victor for uh, many, many years. In fact, Victor is one of the founding board members of GRACE. He's a former child abuse prosecutor and was the founder of the National Child Protection Training Center in, up in Minnesota. Uh, Victor is currently the Director of Education and Research at Zero Abuse Project. Uh, he's the author of countless scholarly articles and some non-scholarly articles. And not too long ago, uh, published a book entitled On This Rock, a call to, the cent call to center the Christian response to child abuse on the life and words of Jesus. Um, please get that book. It's an it's amazing, powerful book, and it's not too thick so everybody can finish reading it. Uh, Victor, as I said, is, uh, is a founding member of the board Gra Gra Grace Board, excuse me, and also a, a board member of Sacred Spaces. Victor, welcome. Thank you. Um, we also have Laura Teen. Laura is a licensed social worker in clinical practice at a rape crisis center uh, in South Carolina. Uh, she's been working with survivors of child abuse, sexual assault, and other trauma for over 10 years in a variety of capacities, including adoptions, foster care, and clinical practice. Uh, much of that time has coincided with advocacy work in the faith community for better prevention, education, and congregational care and she works on the collaboration with the child protection community with faith communities, which is something that is so critically important. Uh, Laura is also a, a board member of Grace and a dear friend and has a lot of really important uh, information to share with us today. Well, Laura, welcome. Our next guest is Rachel Denhollander. Uh, Rachel is an abuse survivor, attorney, author, advocate, and educator who is uh, who's a recognized as a leading voice on the topic of sexual abuse. Uh, she's doing amazing work bridging the gap between survivors and the society and institutions that have failed them, including churches. Uh, she's the author of the book, What is a Girl Worth? Uh, My Story of Breaking the Silence and Exposing the Truth about Larry Nassar and USA Gymnastics. Uh, she's incredibly bright, incredibly articulate. Uh, she is not on the board of grace yet. We'll let you all think about that for a moment. And our last guest uh, this afternoon is my good friend, Justin Holcomb. Justin is an Episcopal priest and teaches theology at two national seminaries. He and his wife, uh, Lindsay, have co-authored a number of books. Some of those are entitled God Made All of Me, Helping Children Protect Their Bodies, which uh, is such an amazing resource for parents. Uh, when they want to have these discussions about abuse and protecting child protection with their children, it does it in such a beautiful and, and um, easy way for parents uh, to, uh, to have those conversations with their kids. Rid of My Disgrace, he's written Hope and Healing for Sexual Assault Victims, and it, Is It My Fault? Hope and Healing for Those Suffering Domestic Abuse. Uh, Justin serves on the Board of Grace and also on the Board of a rest, a real escape from the sex trade. Uh, that is our uh, lineup for today. Again, thank you panelists for joining us uh, this afternoon and thank you for being my friend. <laughs> uh, let's start uh, with Victor this afternoon. Victor, as we sit here in 2020 in the midst of a pandemic, uh, what are some of the risk factors for children being abused and neglected in such an environment? 
there are uh, at least uh, five factors that are likely uh, to increase child abuse during the pandemic. Uh, the first of which is that most child abusers are in the home, they're in the family unit, according to the National Incident Study. If we're speaking about neglect, who is it that withholds food, clothing, shelter, medical care, other necessities? It is typically mom or dad or mom or dad's significant other or another primary caregiver. If we're speaking about physical abuse or emotional abuse, the same study says over 90% of the time the perpetrator is in the family unit, typically mom or dad or another a significant uh, caregiver. Uh, so that's the first factor. Uh, children uh, are in a home, in an environment where uh, uh, most abuse takes place. The second factor is they are now isolated with their potential offenders. So that offender, he or she has 24 7 access to the child, and the child has nowhere else to go typically. The third factor is the pandemic is causing stressors uh, on the family unit. Uh, Parents may be unemployed, they're losing income, traditional outlets to address their anxiety. They can't go to the gym, they can't go to a ball game, they can't uh, go to a movie or uh, a restaurant. They may be uh, adding to some of the anxieties in the family unit. Parents now have to uh, homeschool and in some instances still work full time. Uh, so those added stressors on the family unit is also a factor. Uh, an additional factor is uh, perhaps uh, children are online uh, more often, and uh, we certainly know sexual predators are probably aware uh, of that uh, fact. Uh, there are uh, indicators, uh, NBC News did a report uh, yesterday uh, indicating that cyber tip lines are surging uh, in the nation, which is an indicator that uh, sexual predators are aware that uh, children are online and might be uh, easy uh, fodder for them. Uh, the last uh, factor uh, is that because children are under a quarantine, uh, they're often cut off from teachers and faith leaders. Uh, they're going to the doctor less often. So those are mandated reports those who perhaps have some skills at identifying a sign of abuse, children are now uh, cut off uh, from them. So uh, uh, they just don't have a, a, a recourse of where to go. And I would also add to that, in some family units, they may be cut off from grandparents or others who do look out for them, who are uh, perhaps a, a buffer against uh, stressors uh, in the family. So for all those reasons, most child protection professionals think uh, child abuse is on on the rise. So, so Victor, if if I'm a faith leader now and and I'm watching and listening, you've got my attention, and I am now concerned, perhaps by about certain people in our church, or just concerned in general about how the kids are doing who are part of the congregation of our church or or beyond that. What are some signs uh, of abuse a faith leader? should be aware of and, and how would they even in this type of setting uh, become aware of, uh, of those signs and, and what should they do about that? Um, well, perhaps uh, as a faith leader, you're still uh, intersecting with your parishioners. Maybe you've got a faith-based school or your pastor and you're doing catechism classes and the like, and perhaps you're having a, a Zoom uh, class uh, situation such as we're all uh, on right now in this uh, panel. Uh, and then just pay attention to certain things. Signs of physical abuse would include a, a, a handprint. Uh, so uh, a child's uh, face is slapped uh, very hard. Uh, the hand literally can imprint on the face two or three uh, linear lines. Uh, uh, oftentimes in physical abuse cases, a parent or another perpetrator will grab the child by the ear and you see uh, a pinch mark uh, inside the ear behind uh, the ear. You may pull the child's hair and literally a pocket uh, of hair uh, may come out. Uh, children, when they're whipped with a stick or a belt, they often curl up into a tiny ball to protect their uh, small bodies. Uh, and so you get uh, defensive uh, wounds. So you may have injuries to the forearm. So if you're in a Zoom meeting and a child leads forward like uh, this, you may notice something suspicious on their uh, forearms. Uh, uh, that would be uh, a telltale sign. Beyond that, I would say to pastors and others, when you're dialoguing uh, with students, create an environment uh, where they do have uh, outlets. So if you're in a, say, a faith-based school, say, hey, the school counselors and others are still here, here's how to reach them if you've got concerns or worries, or just generally checking in on families. How's everybody uh, doing? How are you managing uh, stress? And if you see anything uh, concerning, uh, figure out a way to reach uh, that family. 
I would also add one other thing. If you observe something concerning yelling in the background, there was a survey recently where 61% of parents say they had lost their temper and yelled at their kids at least twice in the last week. So if you overhear something like that, even if it doesn't rise to a level where uh, you would make a mandated report, that's a, a sign a family needs some help in managing stress and then look for good evidence-based uh, resources that you can uh, get into that uh, home. Yeah, I think a lot of it is just paying attention and having your antennas up. I mean, you, all of us have been probably on more Zoom and other uh, video conferences than we had ever anticipated a month ago. And, you know, there's a lot you can tell through those types of conversations about the environment. Um, sometimes the environment may be contrived, but, but oftentimes uh, the environment is very real and raw. And just to be paying attention to those types of things and, and knowing what to be looking for, like you said, Victor, Maybe not that I need to call the abuse hotline, but this is a family that's it's really stressed. And as a faith leader, what can we do to reach out to them and, and provide them some, some assistance and encouragement? Uh, that's this is a good time for pastors to give a sermon on these issues, or if they're, uh, I know many clergy are doing daily Zoom devotions for their congregations. So just create an environment where, hey, if you're stressed out, if you're struggling, there are resources, there are people uh, uh, that can help you, and please reach out. Just creating that sort of environment can prevent at least some level of abuse. So Victor, if I'm a pastor and I say, wow, we've worked hard to, pr to develop child protection policies in our church. Um, but wow, now we find ourselves in a pandemic. We're worshiping online. Uh, we're having some Zoom conversations with, with families. Uh, but are these policies um, even relevant anymore? Can we even apply these policies to, to the life as we are living it now? And what types of things can be modified with these policies to be just as vigilant in protecting the children within our churches? If you have a child protection committee or whoever it is that monitors your policies, get together uh, probably in a virtual world in a Zoom meeting and look through those policies and say, hey, what were the goals behind these policies and how do we achieve those girl, uh, goals uh, in the midst of this pandemic? So, for example, uh, you may have had a policy that said if we're going on, say, a school uh, outing, a camping expedition, uh, uh, whatever it may be, we're going to have two uh, adults present uh, as, a, as a check. Um, if we have a faith-based school, the principal or others can walk freely in and out of the classrooms as a check that nothing nefarious or inappropriate is happening. Take those simple goals and say, well, how do I do that in this uh, virtual world? So uh, uh, it could be that you're having uh, Zoom classroom meetings or Bible studies, whatever it may be with uh, youth. Uh, can there be a, a second adult uh, in that meeting? Uh, if that's not possible, can I post it in the uh, public uh, calendar for the school so folks know when uh, these classroom uh, settings are taking place? Can you have an environment where a principal or an elder or someone in can uh, uh, bounce into the Zoom meeting at any time as a, as a check on what's going on? If none of that is an option, can you at the very least have a policy that says, I'm going to record uh, these sessions and they'll be available to a principal or someone else who's a check? Uh, all of that may be a very uh, effective deterrent. Uh, you should uh, also look at, well, how do we make uh, these Zoom meetings uh, as safe as possible? It can be simple rules such as, hey, um, uh, it, uh, it's not going to be uh, a teacher or pastor is not going to be in their uh, bedroom. They're not going to be wearing uh, their pajamas. Uh, if we do have to text folks about the next catechism uh, class, those texts are not going out at two or three in the morning. And there's always at least one adult being copied on communications between uh, the adults uh, and, and the youth. So simple policies you might have in place for in-person meetings, you just take those and modify them for this uh, virtual world. Yeah, and the great thing about it is, is when this is over, and it will be over one day, those policies can still be very relevant uh, in that the life of that church, because I think most of us would agree that that one of the things coming out of this pandemic is the is a brand new understanding and use of this type of communication, and we would probably be naive to think it's just going to suddenly stop uh, when this is finished. And so it's really a way of you know we try to encourage a grace to to for churches to always be evaluating and reevaluating your policies and look at it just like that 
we are reevaluating our policies and actually spending a little bit more time focused on this area of our policies, but it's something that's going to be remain relevant uh, long after this pandemic is, is behind us. Does that make, does that, Rick, do you agree with that? I, I do agree with that. And let me add one thing. You're, you're not alone uh, in this struggle. So if you're wondering how to adjust your policies to the pandemic, you can reach out to Grace. You can re reach out to Sacred Spaces that works within the Jewish community throughout the country. You could reach out to a Zero Abuse Project. You can reach out to your local Children's Advocacy Center, child protection experts. Uh, God has not left you alone in this struggle. There are multiple resources uh, and it is simply a, a matter of reaching out to those resources uh, uh, to get uh, 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 to get the assistance you need in, in adapting the policies to this new environment. Thank you. So we've we've heard a lot about the term trauma, not only uh, in in this conversation, but in the, it seems like in these last weeks, um, we have heard a lot about that term and what it means, especially in the light of of the pandemic. Uh, let's talk about uh, the word trauma, because I think a lot of people uh, who are watching and, and many others uh, are experiencing forms of trauma. And one of the great challenges with that is, is how does one process that trauma and process it in a way that's, that's healthy and productive and not self-destructive, especially during a time like that, uh, like we're in right now. Um, Laura, can let's talk a little bit about that that term trauma. What would be helpful for us to to understand about trauma, and and in addition to that, how trauma ties into the current climate that we're in with this pandemic? Sure. So I think a lot of the time when we think about the word trauma, we think about trauma as an event that occurs. Mm -hmm. um, trauma. Uh, the word in the Greek that that word is derived from actually means wound. So when we think about trauma, thinking about it as the wound that a person experiences as a result of something um, that they've encountered can help us have a little bit better understanding of how that can be um, seen so differently across a spectrum of issues and also across a spectrum of people. Um, the the trauma that people experience can look differently from person to person because the wound is different from person to person. Um, trauma is the body and brain's normal response to an abnormal circumstance. So I think even just being able to shift the way that we think about what trauma actually means and what it is can help us um, as we take a look at our own um, histories and also those of the people around us. Sometimes um, we hear the terms big T trauma and little t trauma shared. Um, so I'd like to share a little bit about that just, you know, to see if that might resonate with anyone. Um, the concept of big T trauma has to do with the wounds and experience that a person has in relation to an event that is threatening their life or bodily integrity. And the kinds of responses and experiences a person might have as a result of that tend to be ones of helplessness, terror, powerlessness, and hopelessness. We see that a lot from events such as um, natural disasters, war, um, interpersonal violence, including sexual trauma. And a lot of times the things that manifest as a result of that experience um, can be the kinds of symptoms that may or may not lead to a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, but they tend to be more severe and prolonged um, than those experienced with little t trauma, which is more associated with events such as interpersonal conflict, financial struggle, um, an unexpected life change. And those um, experiences may still involve an impact of emotional functioning um, and maybe the overwhelm their ability to cope, but not to the same um, longevity and severity as big T trauma. So that kind of is a foundational you know, some terminology surrounding trauma that I think could be helpful for people to think about. And maybe that resonates with some of the folks tuning in um, related to their own experiences. Um, well, let me, let me ask you a real quick question. Does, does little, because this is very helpful to, to hear, can, can little, tr little t trauma impact or aggravate the effects of big t trauma? And, and how would that, if so, um, how does that look like, for example, in a time of, of a pandemic like we're, like we're in? 
So that's a great question. What we see with little t trauma is that if you have a lot of them compounding each other or building on top of each other, um, or maybe a person is predisposed because of um, a history of trauma in the past, the way that they respond could look differently um, and the severity could look differently. So I think, um, you know, for some folks, they might be experiencing this pandemic as a little t trauma, depending on, you know, um, how they're experiencing it economically, um, whether this is, um, you know, a threat to their, um, their life through health issues, um, the way that they interact with the systems that may be predisposed um, toward things like racism. So there's a lot of things that can impact the way a person experiences a trauma as a little t or big t, but those things can certainly impact each other. So if somebody's listening to you right now going, oh my goodness, <laughs> that's me, mm -hmm. um, how, what do they do with that? I mean, what, practically speaking, uh, if they're sitting here today, and they go, that's me, what, what do I do next? What can I do to, to stop this or address it? Mm -hmm. I think part of understanding how to address it is to understand what's happening when we experience it. Okay. Um, so that speaks to the stress response system that happens in the body and the brain when we experience a trauma, whether it's uh, what we consider a big T or little t trauma. Um, when our brains perceive a threat, that threat triggers a whole body response. Um, that whole body response diverts resources, attention, and energy away from other functions of the body to prepare us to survive. So our whole body is going into a self-protection, search for safety survival mode, which looks like fight, flight, or freeze. Um, and those might be terms that some are familiar with, but regardless of which mode you go into, it's, it's a lot of the time out of our control as an automatic response. And so knowing how to cope with our experiences has to do with what happens when our bodies go into that state. And then also the understanding that as a result of us being in survival mode, we are essentially on a big quest for safety. We're looking for things that make us feel safe. We're looking for people that make us feel safe. Um, and a lot of the time that could just be a physical safety thing. I need a, a place to live or a place to um, find food. It could also mean looking for emotional safety. I need someone to trust or I need a place that will care for my emotional needs. So that quest for safety um, is something that anytime we're in that fight, flight, or freeze mode, um, we're going to be looking for. Some of the challenges with the current um, pandemic that we're facing is that even though we are created to seek out safety interpersonally, for a lot of survivors, interpersonal relationships have been a cause of great harm and betrayal. And so as a result of that, where a person might normally look for safety, they may not feel like they can access that in a safe way. So building trusting relationships and being patient and compassionate for those who have that experience will be really important. Um, and that might be a long, slow process, but an important process um, for survivors. Mm. Another, um, another thing that survivors can do is to tend to the physical self, the body, the way that they engage in activity um, and movement to help come out of that freeze state or calm down from that fight or flight state. And I think Rachel's gonna talk a little bit about that um, in a minute. Um, but to acknowledge and validate your experiences and to tend to the parts of yourself impacted by that trauma response, the body, mind, and spirit will be so important. Mm, thank you. I mean, just, just hearing these things and learning about them, um, even though, you know, most of us aren't, aren't therapists or experts, just to, to know them, uh, I think better equips us and gives us at least a few tools in our toolbox to be able to to help uh, in some way, even if it's just being present with, mm -hmm. with those around us who are really struggling mm -hmm. uh, and to maybe get, get, gain a little bit more empathy and understanding to what, what the struggle is all about. So I uh, thank you very much, Laura. That was very helpful. Mm -hmm. So Rachel, um, what, you know, as, as people are stuck in homes and are going out just occasionally, and then when you go out, there's this you know, anxiety about uh, getting too close to other people and the possibility of getting sick and the possibility perhaps of ending up in a hospital or even worse. 
Um, and that's something just about everybody is, is struggling with. What would you say, uh, in your opinion, would be some of the common struggles abuse survivors in particular uh, may be uh, struggling with and experiencing even to a greater degree now during this time of, of coronavirus and, and physical distancing? Yeah, uh, so I'd like to take some time just to kind of piggyback on what Laura was talking about because yeah. I think it's so important to understand. Um, something that was really a game changer for me as a survivor and also as an advocate was being able to understand the why question. Why am I responding this way? Mm. Why am I feeling this way? Uh, because when you can identify the why, that helps give you a constructive path forward. So a dynamic that I want to explore a little bit more for survivors in particular is some of those PTSD type responses uh, that so many survivors suffer from. Anxiety, panic attacks, flashbacks, and look at why those responses might be so heightened right now during COVID and then what we do as a result of that. Uh, and the best way I can kind of help survivors understand and help support people understand is to explain how memories work and what happens when those memories get triggered. So for all of you out there who are watching, I want you to think back to a positive childhood memory, something that you enjoyed. And most likely, as you think of that memory, you're going to see it kind of playing out in front of you, almost like you're watching it in a movie. You'll remember what you felt, you'll remember what you smelled, but it's going to be largely a two-dimensional experience. But that's not what happens with traumatic memories. Research shows us that traumatic memories are actually stored and accessed very differently in the brain. Uh, in fact, there's an awesome book uh, for those of you who want to explore this a little bit more. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. And there's just fascinating research in there. And one of the things that we have learned from doing brain scans of survivors who have had traumatic memories re-triggered is that the brain of the trauma survivor is radically altered. In fact, the brain of a trauma survivor, when traumatic memories resurfaces, actually mimics the brain of a stroke victim because certain parts of the brain completely shut down and other parts that wouldn't normally activate do. So when a traumatic memory is stored and accessed in the brain, what the region that actually lights up is the region that's processing current input, which means that rather than remembering in a two-dimensional form, survivors actually begin to re-experience their trauma. They don't remember what they felt, they actually re-feel it. They don't remember what they heard, they re-hear it. And often this can be a full body uh, experience where survivors even need help reorienting and coming out of these flashbacks or trauma. Uh, and as you can imagine, that's very disruptive to a survivor's life because it puts them back in the trauma that they're constantly in. And what we're seeing right now uh, in COVID and, and with trauma in general is that in response to these flashbacks and the changes that have taken place in our brains and in our bodies from trauma, we develop coping mechanisms explosive anger or shutting people out completely, eating disorder, self-harm, ways of trying to reorient ourselves to reality and trying to find control again, because control is what's been stripped from us. And what we're seeing a lot of in the COVID situation right now uh, is that those responses are being re-triggered because our brain and our bodies learn how to process information based on our experiences. So the brain and the body has learned to process certain things based on the past trauma. And right now those responses are being re-triggered. So past trauma may have caused feelings of hopelessness or loss of control. Sorry, my earpiece has fallen out. Um, it can cause feelings of being out of control. And we're seeing a lot of those feelings resurface in COVID. There's a loss of control. There's isolation. There's a lot of the same feelings that are experienced in abuse that are being recreated during the COVID crisis, and that's re-triggering the body's automatic responses. Uh, and like Laura said, it often puts us into fight or flight or freeze mode. And so understanding that and how differently uh, these, these are processed for a survivor is really critical to just understanding why these responses are going to be so heightened for so many people during this crisis. Mm, that's helpful. So, so let me follow that up, Rachel, with sort of two categories of, of people. Um, the first category would be abuse survivors themselves. What are some, some practical, and Laura's touched on these as well, uh, self-care steps that they can take in the midst of this? Oftentimes at home, they can't go out. Um, you know, they feel like the, their options are limited. And then secondly, what are some practical steps that, that non-survivors can take in reaching out and caring and loving 
for those survivors around them uh, and their friends, that's going to be actually helpful. Yeah. Um, so honestly, I think one of the most important things for a survivor to do uh, is really get a proper definition of healing first and foremost, because survivors feel incredible guilt, not just for their abuse, but often for not being able to heal from their abuse. And a lot of times what happens when these memories are re-triggered and these trauma responses are re-triggered is survivors begin to feel incredible guilt. Why am I not over this? What is, you know, what did my therapy actually accomplish? Uh, and, and it just begins this spiral of, uh, it can even, even become self-loathing. Uh, and so having a proper definition of healing is one of the most important things that we have to have. Understanding that healing doesn't mean the wounds aren't there. It means that you know what to do with the pain when it comes and not being crushed under the false guilt of having these responses re-triggered. These are valid and legitimate wounds. And like any physical injury, when that wound is pressed, it's going to hurt. Uh, and so not feeling that false guilt. And then being able to take the next step of, of really identifying what's going on so you can form a path forward. I'm a huge proponent of journaling, especially in situations where you are more isolated. So taking time to really sit down and think through, what am I feeling? Why am I feeling that way? Uh, and being able to identify and find a healthy way to express those emotions, whether it's music, art, poetry, writing, um, being able to identify your emotions and find a healthy way to express them. And then to look at constructive paths for addressing them. Uh, learning not to view life through the lens of trauma is a long process, uh, but an important part of that can be looking at some of the differences in what we're experiencing now versus what we experienced in trauma. So being able to say, for example, I'm feeling very isolated, but what are some differences now versus in the trauma? Looking for the healthy relationships we do have, even though they're limited. Uh, learning to uh, look at some of the differences between loss of control during trauma and loss of control now. We're both, we're experiencing a loss of control in both situations, but are there healthy ways that I can identify that I do have more control over my situation, over my life, over my choices and my responses than I had at the point of being abused? And to differentiate the situation now from the past trauma as those responses are being triggered. Working on very healthy coping mechanisms, uh, something very basic, uh, that I think survivors can do, and that I encourage survivors to do, is to put together an emergency box for dealing with anxiety and flashbacks, uh, putting something in there uh, that they can smell, that they can safely taste, that they can listen to, that might be, you know, peppermints, a favorite essential oil, uh, a music playlist, uh, and some things that will, will go far in helping distract their mind, adult dot to dots or art supplies, and having them all in one place so that when the survivor begins to feel those first signs of anxiety, uh, you know exactly where to go and you have a plan in place that you're committed to following. Yeah, and that sounds very simple, but sometimes the simplest steps are really the greatest victories. Uh, loss of control is a huge thing that many survivors are feeling right now and that lack of structure. Many of us are off of work. We don't have the routines of you know, our physical communities, our religious communities, uh, but can we put a routine and structure in our day? Can you make a basic plan and outline for what you want to accomplish each day? Can you put something on there that's a goal that you had? Maybe a book that you've always wanted to read or a podcast you've wanted to start listening to, uh, a skill uh, that you've wanted to try or, or, you know, making bread or a recipe you want to try. Uh, and the point of having a list like that isn't uh, to put guilt on you if you don't make it through and check it off, but rather to give you uh, a sense of control over what you're doing to help you realize the decisions that you do have in your power and to provide some structure to the day. And paying attention, uh, like Laura said, just to the very basic needs that our body has, putting good routines in place at night so that you can get good rest to the best of your ability, uh, having a good diet uh, and good exercise. Uh, there is some fascinating research that's been coming out lately uh, between the relationship between our physical bodies and physical activity and how that helps reintegrate our bodies and our neurobiology after trauma. So can you set a simple goal of getting outside every day uh, or, you know, in, um, you know, plug into an online exercise community uh, or an online nutrition community that might help uh, give some of that structure, but also help provide community uh, in, in times when we don't have it very easily. Mm -hmm. This is really helpful and really practical. What, what about people who say, you know, I, 
I have a friend or a family member who's really struggling. They're an abuse survivor and, and I don't know really what to say or do. And I don't want to say or do the wrong thing. And they may be even struggling thinking every time I try to say or do the, something, I, I end up blowing it. And so they end up just keeping a distance and not doing anything. What, what type of advice can you, can you give those folks? I think for support people, the first thing that we have to understand is how legitimate and real the wound is. Mm -hmm. And being able to help the survivor speak truth over those circumstances, grieving with the survivor over the wound and providing healthy ways to grieve is one of the most important things uh, that all of us need. Because it provides, it, it not only speaks truth into the situation, but it also provides some of that physical community that's missing. Uh, it, and the ability to, to grieve and to listen and to help the survivor remember truth when they can't remember it themselves are really the most important things uh, we can do. And that requires for the support person, that requires understanding the legitimacy of the trauma. And something that I feel is uh, very helpful for all of us to do is to really equate trauma with the physical wound. You know, if you had somebody in front of you who had been hit by a drunk driver and they needed therapy or they were limited in their mobility or they were suffering from chronic pain, you, know, you would respond to that person by addressing the legitimacy of their needs and their wounds. You wouldn't be putting false guilt on them for feeling pain. Their pain is legitimate. They've suffered a horrific injury. Mm -hmm. You would be recognizing the added need that they have for medical care and for therapy to address the specific wound and what that would feel like uh, if, the, if the survivor of a car accident all of a sudden didn't have access to their medical care. Um, you know, and so equating trauma with the physical wound and realizing the reality uh, of that trauma, helping the survivor uh, be released from false guilt uh, for those things, I think is one of the most critical things that support people can do. But it really does take a shift of our mind uh, from thinking of trauma as just a mental thing to realizing the, the actual damage that it does and that it has very physical ramifications on our bodies, on our brains, on our uh, our central nervous systems, our hormones, all of those things are affected in trauma. So trans, so oftentimes I'll ask, a, I'll ask a support person or survivor that very question, what would you say if you were talking to someone who had been in a catastrophic car accident, how would you respond? Uh, and that really helps shift that mental focus for them. And it, it gives you the ability to grieve with the person who has suffered and to understand their suffering in a new way. Mm, that's really helpful. Um, yeah, we're, it's, I was just thinking as you were talking that I'm glad this is being recorded so that we can go back and, and watch it all over again because in such a short time we've packed so much really helpful sort of academic sort of foundational information combined with a lot of really practical advice. And uh, again, I just am so grateful for this, uh, for this time together and, and for each of our guests. Justin, pastors, pastors who are watching, church leaders who are watching, uh, they are dealing with their own challenges now uh, of moving from, you know, weekly in-person meetings to setting up, you know, a virtual church and virtual meetings. And, and uh, that comes with its own anxieties and, and struggles. And, and we, you know, we want to empathize with that because that's got to be really difficult for, for a, lot of, uh, a lot of pastors. In addition to that, they still have the congregation that uh, they are to be ministering to and to be serving. And a lot of those people in their congregation are abuse survivors. I often use the, the statistics. If you have one in four women and, and one in six men who have survived uh, childhood sexual abuse, if you had a church of 100 men and 100 women, I keep it simple because I'm terrible at math, uh, you would have a church of 20.5% of your congregation as abuse survivors. And so... If we think at, of the world we're living in now, based on what you know, Rachel and Laura just shared with us, um, you know, at least 20% of your church could be survivors of, of sexual abuse or sexual assault, if not more. And, and they are struggling with the very things that have just been talked about. And how, how do pastors even begin? Because I, I talked to a few pastors that just seem overwhelmed overwhelmed with even just trying to get, you know, the, the virtual service online for Sunday compared to, you know, trying to reach out and minister to their congregation, which is a challenge as well. Um, what do you say to those pastors uh, to help educate and encourage them 
on how they can best identify and help and serve the survivors within their churches who are who are probably struggling and many of them are probably struggling in silence they're not making their struggles known how can pastors identify and be proactive and not not fear and be anxious about it and back away from these profound needs great question and uh, first let's empathize with the ministers yeah. because just and i'm a minister i work for a denomination we have 85 churches in our region and at least two or three hundred ministers clergy who are involved so i i've been talking to them there's compassion fatigue happening right now of people just generally people losing their jobs people are anxious they miss church they miss the community so uh, there's some compassion fatigue this is not just for clergy but it is especially bad for clergy but sleep disruption is through the roof i'm going to bed at about two o'clock in the morning right now I thought I was the only one. And then I talked to a group of clergy. Apparently all of us are doing that and, and non-clergy are also doing that. But part of that is because uh, serving as a minister, there's a blur. There, there's, less, uh, there's less distinct boundaries between life, non-work, and ministry and work. And it gets all muddled together. And especially now, just like everyone else's life, you're going from tutoring in math to making financial decisions and, and it's happening with ministers also. So the, the blurred lines between work and non-work life are even more blurred for them. And ministers aren't usually the best at keeping those boundaries uh, healthy. Um, so what, I would rec what I've been recommending is go find the counselors that you have been meeting with or that you recommend parishioners meet with call them. They're doing, they're doing uh, teleconferencing, Zoom counseling. They will meet with you and, and recognize that the, the pressure for everyone else is also a pressure for you. And be very intentional of creating networks of other clergy. One of the most important things a clergy person can do, and this is from a Lilly Endowment Million Dollar Research, they said for sustainable and effective ministry, the most important thing that can be done are peer clergy groups where you're actually getting together once a month, sharing the load, telling the stories, praying for each other, supporting each other. And uh, it took a, mil a few million dollars to figure that out, but see if you can create the community that you actually need with your colleagues. So that's the empathy. That's, it, it is, uh, but this is what clergy signed up for. This is what, if you've signed up to be a shepherd, this is what you signed up for are moments like this. And this isn't the kind of beat your chest, rah, rah, let's go get the, you know, go, go attack the hill. I'm not trying to, uh, to, to give you more burden, but this is what the church is for. In the middle of fear, lack of hope, uh, wondering about the future, like this is where the message of Christianity comes through loud and clear. So uh, just kind of setting the tone, but particularly for our topic, uh, regularly, the prevalence is bad. The, the statistics you just gave, Boz, are very important. One in four women and one in six men are or will be survivors, victims of sexual assault. For intimate partner abuse, domestic violence, it's one in four women, one in 20 men. At a time when unemployment increases, we also see a spike in uh, domestic abuse because usually the perpetrator is a man. Um, and when and it's about power and control and when a man loses his employment, grabbing for power and control, frustration, stressors, uh, is, uh, is uh, domestic abuse increases. So now is a time where that's actually happening. One in five children will be sexually abused before their 18th birthday. Th those are the regular statistics at, at typical times. Now, because of exactly what, what Victor was telling us earlier on, that most of the abusers, most of the perpetrators are known to the survivors. And now they are, there's even more access to them. And the victims, the survivors, don't have the, the normal group of people that they would regularly have readily available to help if they, were, if they don't have their Sunday school teacher or their teacher or their Boy Scout coach or their dance instructor. So the isolation is causing an increase. All of the domestic violence hotlines are reporting increase in calls, increase in, in traffic to their websites. So that's, that's the need. <clears throat> now for, for clergy, faith, 
faith community leaders think through with me the avenues of communication that you have. We'll talk about what to communicate in a second, but you have video sermons, at least one or two a week are taking place. So you have that avenue. Some, as Victor mentioned also, there's, there's regular emails to members from the, the pastors, like a daily devotional. My, my, my minister where I serve, where I go, where I attend, is, he's daily emails or daily devotionals. There's networks of communication from community groups, Bible study groups, affinity groups, youth groups. You have the social media communication, Zoom, Skype, other, other options for video conferencing, and even text groups. So, so there's networks of care set up. We have actually plenty of options to actually, now it's not optimal, you're not face-to-face, -face, but we do have lines of communication. So using those lines of communication, a few things that clergy to communicate be aware of. One, please communicate that you are aware that abuse is increasing. That way, uh, it, the, the person who needs your attention doesn't feel like they're the weirdo. It's normal to actually, so communicating that you get it. Communicating, I understand, now do it, you can do it subtly, you can do it clearly. Uh, there's different modes of your communication and you know what works best for you, but communicating, I am aware that instances of abuse are on the increase because of isolation. The other thing is to communicate that your role is to help, but also to listen to them. Being vigilant to listen is one of the most helpful things that a clergy person can do. The numerous, numerous points of research that said being listened to and believed is one of the most helpful things at the point of disclosure. So be ready to listen. Some, some clergy are almost um, nervous to invite it because they don't feel like they can fix it. They don't feel like they have the answer. They don't, they're not therapists. And this is a moment of trauma and they feel ill-equipped. We're not. Let's, we should know our role. Some of us are. Uh, some people are therapists and ministers. But knowing our role and not minimizing the power of being the person that someone discloses, the courage and bravery it takes for them to disclose, the holy ground that you're on, if you're simply listening, believing them, and acknowledging the pain of what they've gone through, you don't need to have all the answers. They actually don't need you. The, the, the survivor doesn't need you to have all the answers. What they actually want is the person who, um, in their life, speaks, speaks from God, preach, preaches the Bible, talks about Jesus. Having that person looking with compassion and awareness and nodding of affirming that yes, that is horrible and that's painful is very powerful. Another thing you do, so being aware that the, there's an increase, um, being ready to listen, and having compassionate, practical, and informed care. Uh, there are hotlines all over the place. There, there's three that I want to remind you all of, of. So the clergy, the, there's the domestic, uh, national domestic violence hotline. National Sexual Assault Hotline, National Child Abuse Hotline, and there's Grace. We're here to help and serve how we can. And there's websites, there's phone numbers. You can actually make those available. We have we encourage clergy to send out, if you need help, contact us. Here are the websites. Here are the phone numbers that you can go to. So giving them those, uh, those resources. Uh, I, I, I have a chapter, Lindsay and I, my wife, wrote a chapter called Am I in an Abusive Relationship? And we have a PDF of that chapter that's at the Grace website, thinking through you as the minister reading through that, you making that available uh, to, hey, increase, abuse is increasing. You might know someone that needs these resources. Uh, or also, in addition to that, another resource is a, a PDF of uh, an appendix from our book, Is It My Fault? Uh, and it's making a safety plan. One of the most important things that someone suffering abuse can do is make a safety plan. Whether they're ready to leave the, the scenario where they are, the environment, or not, one of the most helpful things and healthy things for their safety is making a safety plan. Departing an abusive environment is actually one of the most dangerous times and places. And so having a safety plan in place, it's a 14 page of just questions to think through uh, to help you plan for when you might need to leave and be in a safe place. Mm -hmm. Invite them to contact you or the hotline or the police. 
just saying clearly, I'm available, these resources are available, contact the police if you need to. And then finally, offer them words of hope. Uh, Victor mentioned this uh, earlier on, but you have video sermons, you have daily devotionals, but in your mind, have the increase in abuse there because the word of hope applies to everyone. We need it. I need it. I'm going crazy myself. I'm, I'm not sleeping and I'm feeling anxious. And if I not having the deep tremors of trauma kind of reverberating right now, we all need these words of hope. Everyone is going to hear your words of hope and comfort of proper healing, as Rachel just said, compassion, good news. And if you can connect the dots, this is the, this, Jesus didn't just die for our sins because we're guilty. He also did his work of redemption for healing, for, the, for when we are being sinned against. He's fixing sin, not just guilt. He's fixing the sins we commit and the sins that have been committed against us. And having that in mind when you're talking about the good news and words of comfort will be very important because they will hear it, but so will everyone else who aren't survivors. They still need that word of comfort also. Well, as you were talking, I was, I was thinking just in my experience dealing with this issue for the past 20 some years, uh, I have encountered countless numbers of people in churches and other faith communities who are uh, survivors and who are suffering in silence because they do not believe, and oftentimes for good reason, that their church or faith community is a safe place for them. So in order to, to keep safe and to protect themselves, they just remain silent about it. And I couldn't help, as, as you were talking, I, I thought, man, what if, what if one of the, and I always, I always believe in, in beauty coming out of ashes. And, and I think many of us are, are, and many people who are listening now are, I feel like they're amidst the ashes. But what if one of the beauties coming out of all of this is that a survivor goes, wow, like I learned for the very first time that my pastor actually cares and understands and my church actually actually reached out and was proactive. And like for the very first time, I feel like my faith community is a safe space <laughs> and that I actually may actually come forward and, and feel more empowered to talk about the, the, the most horrific trauma that's ever been perpetrated against me in the place that I should feel the most safe, but for most of my life, I haven't. Taking those practical approaches, because I, th I, I meet a lot of pastors, I think they, a lot of them, not all, but a lot of them want to do the right thing. They just, they don't have those tools in their toolbox. And so they oftentimes just rather just stay away from it. And what you're saying is no, be intentional, move towards it but move towards it in an informed, empathetic, humble, compassionate way. And I just think, wow, what, what the difference could be inside the church if even we look back at, at COVID-19 and say that was, that was one of the moments where the eyes of the church and the heart of the church were opened up to those who've been struggling in silence for, for decades. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely. And hey, the narcissistic pastors... Um, th there's a small there many of those, there's pl but there's a small group of them. And you're right, Boz. Most of the people serving in church, that's what th they care. And, and yeah. I started talking to the clergy in, in our denomination and they started sending these, these just all, everything I just said here, they started doing this and they started sending me some of their thank you emails. Or, thank you so much. Like I'm not a survivor, but I love that my church is talking about this. Mm -hmm. And then, and then they started getting emails from survivors mm. saying, I'm so proud of my church. Thank you. I need this actually. And so just the simple words of hope and comfort, practical compassion and informed responses go a long way. So exactly what you're imagining that of course, God is so sovereign and creative that he will bend a pandemic into the good for his glory and for his sheep. That sounds like something God would do. But what you're actually, what you're describing as a potential hope is actually happening right now. I'm seeing it. Um, and it's unbelievably encouraging because of what you just said. They, they signed up for this because they actually, for the most part, they care. The vast majority of clergy care. They've been recipients of good news and they want to be agents of the good news that they were given. And, and that's the beauty of this is that 
if they have the right information, if they're listening to Victor and Laura and, 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 and Rachel, that's, this is the material, this is the content that they need to have so they can actually make wise and informed uh, uh, ministry decisions. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, I want to keep us to our, uh, as close as we can to our hour. I don't think like we just automatically get shut off, uh, but I want to be respectful of everybody's time. Um, I just, as we close, I would like to, for each of the panelists, um, and this is sort of a broad, broad question, keep it short, but, but answer it the way you want. If you could share one additional thing to those watching, uh, and, and much more from your heart, uh, maybe even less from your head, but from your heart, one thing that, that, that you would like to impart on those watching uh, in relation to the, uh, and to the topic that we've talked about today, what, uh, what would that be? Let me, uh, we'll just go in reverse order. Justin, didn't give you much time to think about it. No, no. What happened to you is not your fault. You're not to blame. You didn't deserve it. God's not doing this to you. He's not getting his pound of flesh. Uh, he's not, abuse didn't happen to you because you're a bad mom, because you had an abortion, because you had premarital sex. He's, he's not angry at you. Karma is not happening. God doesn't do karma. Grace is the opposite of karma. And that's what God is about, is mercy and grace. Not getting pound of flesh, not, uh, not hurting his children, but hoping, giving them hope and healing. And Psalm 55, I want to encourage all the survivors to um, go through Psalm 55, which is a psalm from David talking about, some of his psalms are about the enemies coming after me. Psalm 55 is about my friend, my acquaintance who harmed me and the type of pain from someone who is an acquaintance that causes harm, someone who has the intimacy of closeness. Psalm 55 has been a place that I've pointed to a lot of people. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel. Honestly, I think a lot of what Justin said, to give yourself grace, to give yourself the room to grieve, to know that the pain is valid and legitimate, and for those walking alongside to give the survivors space to grieve, but also to know that the grief points you towards the light. Something that's been very helpful for me to remember as I'm feeling the grief and struggling with, why do I feel this grief still? Why am I not past this? Uh, is that the grief is, is real and you can feel it because the opposite of it is also so true. You know, the more you understand about goodness and hope and beauty and love and the reality of those concepts, I believe, is they're found in Christ. The more you understand about those things, the greater you are going to recognize the aberration from them. And so to recognize, I do feel the grief of the abuse and of the brokenness and of the trauma. And I feel it because it's real and it's legitimate. It is such an apparition from what it was supposed to be. And that allows you to grieve without feeling pressure to minimize or, uh, or to feel guilt. But it also allows you to grieve with hope, to know that you can recognize the evil because the goodness does exist and to be able to speak truth into it. Thank you. Laura? Um, I was just thinking as everyone was talking about um, our dear colleague, Diane Langberg, and some of the words that she shares in her writings about the impact of trauma on um, voice, our telling of our stories, our power, which is our ability to make choices, and our relationships, our connection to ourself, others, and, and even God. And as we think about how trauma um, distorts, um, destroys, disconnects, and disrupts, those elements of ourselves, healing can look like restoring and creating those things. So as we consider our own suffering um, and our, you know, the trauma of those around us um, and thinking about how overwhelming it can be to, to try to remember even some of these practical things, if what we're doing is redemptive and restoring, then most likely it's what we should be doing. So that's what I would lead us with today. Wise words. Victor. I think it must have been extraordinary, extraordinarily comforting to Jesus to have uh, at least some people who didn't abandon him at the cross, that there were women uh, who just by their presence were uh, comforting the Lord. 
Uh, and so I would say to those who are out there who feel overwhelmed, how do I minister? How do I work with survivors? Just your presence, just your uh, voice, uh, just simply saying, I'm, I'm here and I'll walk the dark valley with you and we'll uh, figure it out one, one day at a time. When I was in uh, seminary, a uh, pastoral uh, care uh, uh, counselor said, uh, uh, a good phrase that you often found helpful is, you know, I don't know what to say and I don't know what to do, but I'm going to stick with you uh, till we figure it out to, together. Uh, so those simple acts of kindness are always needed, but now uh, needed more uh, than ever. So uh, let's make ourselves available to those that are, are suffering in whatever way that we can. And I'm sure when we do that, God, who is watching us from a distance, uh, uh, is, is pleased. Yeah. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. I want to thank, uh, while this time went by really fast, uh, I just want to thank uh, the panelists. Uh, I thank you for your friendship. Uh, I thank you for your wisdom. I thank you for your kindness to me in so many ways. But I thank you today for the kindness you have demonstrated and the wisdom you have displayed to, to those uh, who are participating in, uh, in this discussion. Uh, I just am so grateful uh, for each of you. I thank everybody for joining us today uh, at our first event, and we will be back. Um, but we are, we are here for you. As, as Victor just said, I just wrote it down. Uh, we're going to stick with you. Grace is going to stick with you. And so if you are in need of help, uh, if you're a church leader and want to know more about uh, the, the safeguarding initiative or our independent investigations, go to our website at uh, netgrace.org, excuse me, O-R-G. And, uh, and we can, there's plenty of information there that you can learn more about the organization, but also there's lots of resources, lots of, of video and written resources for you to comb through. And, and hopefully um, much of that can be of, of help to you. And I guess I would just say, finally, uh, I think overall, this has been an encouraging uh, and inspiring discussion, but it's still a discussion about some difficult stuff. And so if, if you're somebody who's you know, participated in this, and find yourself maybe even struggling with some of the things we've talked about. Um, I just would encourage you to exercise self-care. Go do something to take care of yourself um, for the rest of the day. Focus on you. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, because sometimes these types of topics, uh, they're really important for us to hear and to process. But we also need to take a step back and care for ourselves and those around us. So again, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon. And uh, we look forward to doing this again, hopefully sometime soon. Have a great Saturday afternoon. And remember, tomorrow, Blue Sunday, pray for kids and vulnerable people uh, who need protection and who need justice.